Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. We're now on episode number 591. My name is Camden Busey. I'm pastor of Hope Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Grays Lake, Illinois. And I'm back with an old friend, uh, co-founder of Reformed Forum, Dr. Jeffrey Waddington. Jeff, hey, how are you doing today? It's good to see you. I'm good. I'm doing doing fine. It's nice to have a break from... Uh, grading papers uh, oh, for my, the classes at Westminster Seminary. Uh, and how many do you have before before you? Well, I have uh, all told. I, I just worked on fifteen, somewhere between fifteen and twenty this morning, <laughs> and then they're they're on average ten to thirteen pages a piece, and so I have about two hundred left. Two hundred papers five, or pa- five classes. 200 and papers. When I, when I say papers, I mean both digests and papers. Sure. There's about 50 that are quote unquote papers where there's original <laughs> thinking. The, <laughs> the, the, the digests are meant to show that they're, they're understanding. Well, they're yeah, thinking. there's still supposed to be some original thinking in the digest because you're supposed to digest it. Yes. I, um, and they've been, they've been very good. I must say from year to year, the quality of the oh, student good. does vary. This year, the quality is very good, I think. I was talking to, uh, or I think I heard this secondhand from somebody, so uh, from a, a TA um, at Westminster. This is it's probably a tell it not in gaff uh, moment. I probably shouldn't <laughs> say this, but um, anyway, the TA was reading a digest one time and thought, this sounds really strange. Like something's goofy about this, some of the phrasing and whatnot. So they did a Google search and it turned out that there was a chunk of an Amazon review that was copied and pasted into the digest. Oh my goodness. Yeah, terrible. Okay. So you always got to watch out. Don't, don't that, ever turn into a, into a mindless drone when you're reading those digests. Yes. <laughs> Well, which is the, of course, the the difference between digests and papers. That papers are going to be very, very on topic, right? Whereas you digest, hope. because you're looking at fifty to seventy five of the yeah. same reading material, there there's a you can do it quicker. But on the other hand, yeah, there's the a t- it becomes a mindless. It can be temptation to become a, a drone. Yeah, and that, I know some professors, especially with exegetical papers, will sometimes give the students a choice of three or four texts, and that's merely because the professor needs to understand those texts quite well and yes, and be familiar with all the exegetical issues. So that could be a challenge too. But uh, you're not great in those, so no. Nope. Yeah, um, and each professor will vary among themselves as to how much a TA is doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it so it fluctuates or be in depending on the class that I'm TAing for. I'm doing five this semester, so wow. that's why the, I have such the a lar- so large, large. Uh, caseload. Well, uh, we'll pray for you, and we hope the best as you uh, continue to to labor and serve uh, the seminary and the larger church in that regard. So keep it up, and don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't become overwhelmed with all the things before you there. But today we're going to be speaking about an important subject. Uh, we're getting back uh, to theology today, as we as we do so often. Today we're going to be speaking about a lecture that uh, Jeff delivered in the Doctrine of Christ class back in March, and yep. uh, so we're going to use that as our as our uh, foundation and spring off of that uh, toward our conversation today. The lecture Jeff titled back then was The Unchanging God and the Incarnation, the Creator-Creature Distinction in the Hypostatic Union. This is an important topic. Now, it wasn't too long ago that you and Adam York and I discussed uh, impeccability, the doctrine of yes. impeccability, not just the the fact that Jesus Christ as the incarnate uh, Son of God, the, the God-man, fully God and fully man. It's not merely that he didn't sin, but that he was unable to sin. Right. There are critics of the doctrine of impeccability that say, well, if Jesus, it wasn't possible for him to sin, then he wasn't fully a human. And so they right. take that to be some f- mild form of docetism. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you do advocate that Jesus possibly could have sinned, in our estimation, and where we came down in that episode was that you're bordering on Nestorianism, that Jesus is two persons, and that a, a nature cannot sin in and of itself, but requires uh, you know, an active moral choice uh, that would be right. attendant to personality and a person. And so Jesus Christ, of course, being the eternal Son of God, the only begotten Son of the Father, second person of the Trinity, is one person now with two natures. We'll talk about that, that 
that union of those two natures in the person of the Son is what we call right. the hypostatic union, because the person of the Son is, uh, comes from that Greek word uh, hypostasis. So the Father is a hypostasis, the Son's hypostasis, the Spirit's hypostasis. There are three right. hypostases in the Trinity, uh, and they're one essence. One essence, three hypostases, and that is God. That's, that's right. irreducible. So we shouldn't think of it apart from the essence, shouldn't think of one hypostasis apart from the others. Nonetheless, right. there is a real and true distinction among them. There are three modes of subsistence in the Trinity. That's not modalism, but that's orthodox theology, three modes of subsistence in the Trinity, right. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and these three are one and the same God. So we're opening up that today, going to talk about this lecture. And uh, as we often like to do in this uh, old Westminster tradition of, uh, of uh, biblical and systematic theology, we like to not merely provide uh, Reformed confessions. We, we need to provide our Reformed confessions. We have to do our theology within the confessional tradition because we believe those are based on Scripture. Uh, but we also don't merely want to provide proof texts and just uh, you know throw a couple verses out there, but actually do right. sustained exegetical treatments of of key programmatic texts. And and if we're going to do that with the hypostatic union, what are some texts we're going to look at, Jeff? Well, certainly the one that I open up the the lecture with is Philippians two five through eleven, mm-hmm. what the passage known as the Carmen Christi or the the, the Song of Christ mm. or Poem of Christ. Um, and it's a passage that we're familiar with. And the reason I began with this is simply to sensitize the students to the issue of uh, what we call kenoticism, right? The, mm-hmm. the idea Empty. that the son emptied himself of his divinity uh, when he uh, became a man. Uh, and of course, the, the uh, John Murray, Professor John Murray, uh, erstwhile professor at Westminster made it clear that the uh, incarnation was by addition, not by subtraction. Sure, that's a very good that, way to put it. We should, uh, you know, people will hear that kenoticism or kenosis and have a knee jerk reaction and say that's bad. Now, as we understand kenosis, it is bad. That's a that's a heresy. But the word right. itself is actually found the text. In, in the yeah. text. So. The text. So the, the problem is not with kenosis as a word or a verb. The problem is what do we see Christ as emptying himself of? Is he emptying right. himself of his divinity so that for this period of time during his, his earthly estate, his earthly life and ministry, the incarnate time prior to his resurrection, was he fully God then? That's really the question. Right. Or did he somehow leave that behind? And right. So become what is Paul? Fully man without what is it. Paul saying? Because remember, this is the basis for an ethical exhortation, right? You know, let this mind be in you, or have oh, this yes. mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. He's, yes. And then, then Paul goes into the who, uh, though in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. His his divinity wasn't, uh, or the prerogatives of his divinity, I think, would be more accurate way to think about this it was not a thing to be held on to to be grasped but he emptied himself and there's the expression uh, echinosin uh, the form that as it appears in the text he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant uh, being born in the likeness of men uh, so and being found in human form he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on the cross so that's the nadir the bottom point the bedrock of of the incarnation is of course the crucifixion yeah the the the, 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 uh, the apex of his estate of humiliation right. yeah correct the 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 the, the uh, the omega point, as Lane would like to say, of, right. of his humiliation right. is, is death on the cross. So, I mean, if if someone, and this was more, I guess, a more popular school of interpretation, the, the kenotic theory, uh, I guess, had its popularity, one, in, 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 in the Scandinavia, that's where its origin is from. Uh, and it was popular in the 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm sure there are folk who embrace this now. But if you think about it, if if Christ were to, or the Son of God were to empty himself of his divinity, 
he couldn't save us. Sure. He'd be a, he'd be a mere man, which would mean that he would be under the law in a way that we we understand the Son of God is not under the law. Right. The whole point of the incarnation is that the Son of God voluntarily took to himself a true body and a reasonable soul. As Paul will say in Galatians, uh, in the fullness of, t- of time, he was born of a woman, born under the law. But as the Son of God, and remember, the person of the Son is not the result of the hypostatic union. Oh, I yeah. wonder how many people think that that's that that the person of the Son of God is the result or uh, of the combination. First of all, combination is a bad way of thinking about it. The hypostatic union. Uh, the Son is the eternal second person of the Godhead, the Logos, as we, uh, as yeah. the Apostle John would put it, right? Mm-hmm. Is is the person, uh, the Son, the person of the Son is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what he sets aside, uh, moving along in our conversation, is he sets aside the prerogatives, the outward manifestation of his glory. Uh, is what is set aside. And it's that outward manifestation of his glory that that in the second portion of this text manifests itself. Because mm-hmm. he has been ob- the son has been obedient to the father to the extent that he gives his life on the cross to die for sin, uh, our sins that he himself had not personally committed. So now, after with that having having been accomplished, the death of Christ, therefore, Paul says, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, when when Paul says that he's given the name that is above every name, that doesn't mean that his name wasn't Jesus from his birth. <laughs> simply to recognize that that he is now Lord, right? He is, and this is in some ways parallel to the Romans 1, 3, and 4. Yeah, I just preached that, that uh, two two days ago. Yeah, yeah that he was declared right? to be the Son of God in power by the Spirit of holiness right. according to the, or by his resurrection. That It's it's important here, you, you drew this out with Murray, but this emptying is by addition, correct? And it's the humiliation the comes not right, not by removing something from himself, but by adding something else. Adding, and then by correct. the addition of this morpho morphe to dulu, the form of a servant, correct. we could also say by the addition now, the assumption of a human nature. That assumption, uh, prior to the resurrection, has the effect of veiling Christ, correct. veiling the eternal glory of the sun. So it's very important that um, even if we are to use the language to say set aside as divine prerogative, that that is the, that is merely to say that that it is a availing of his right. eternal glory and an availing of his present e- and ongoing eternal reign right. for a time. So it's not as if the son somehow removed himself from the essence of God so that he is no longer present in right. the eternal throne room and, as fully God. But it is to say that historically speaking re- and redemptive historically speaking, for a time when he was born all the way up until he died on the cross and remained in the grave for three days, for that period of time, his his eternal essence, his glory uh, is veiled. It it breaks through in moments where we see at yes. his birth the, the angels... Um, praising his name from heaven. We see at the Mount of Transfiguration, almost yeah. as if the curtains were pulled back and the and J- right. Peter, James, and John could see what is eternally and true and ongoing. But but for Amen. the rest of us and, and for normal earthly existence in that time, Jesus is veiled by that human nature until he's right. raised from now, the dead. Camden, is there a way we can even tweak that a little bit? It just dawned on me because... Christ's glory is fully made manifest with a human nature in heaven at the Father's right hand, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because remember, Christ, the Son of God, takes to himself a human nature from that point forward on into eternity. There's no Mm -hmm. point at which he sets aside the incarnation. Indeed. 
So it's, it's the veiled in flesh for the time of humiliation that, that is the setting aside. We may say that, put it that more fine tune it. Well, I guess, I mean, um, maybe I'm not uh, following, well, but my, I definitely my, my would point say is it's there's not just the human nature, taking a human nature that mm. is, that is uh, the emptying uh, because he has that human nature in a glorified state now and forever oh of course no i was i'm speaking in a in a historical uh frame of mind that for the period uh, that began when he was conceived by the holy ghost in the in the womb of the virgin mary up until his his uh resurrection that is a state of humiliation but it's not the function purely the function of of assuming a human nature that has the veiling it's the humiliation for that right. period that's because right. that's that that's what i was thinking right the, the hypostatic union persists as we'll see as jeff will develop the chalcedonian formula yep. uh, and explain that to us sure uh, christ and, is still the fully the god man yes, uh, though he is no longer veiled and i do also but, want to say that there we also ought to affirm the fact that there is a change, uh, in in a sense, in the upper register before and after the resurrection, because now the angels even rejoice and worship in a new way that I presume right. that I think the Bible teaches they did not worship in that same way prior to the resurrection of Christ. So right. there, there's there's a re, in a sense a covenant historical or some sort of liturgical historical change, even in and, the upper register. Right, and I dare sense there'll be another one. I, I dare say that mm. there'll be another one when the Lord returns. Yeah, right. And and there'll be a, an increase with, of right. uh, increase of praise and glory. Yeah. So you made mention of the Chalcedonian formula. The Council met in in four fifty one and formulated uh, what I would call, I guess, a hermeneutical principle for understanding how the two natures of of the Son of God or of Christ are united. And this is, I'm going to read it to, because it is, it's that important, I think. We yeah, then it's really follow, important. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, I believe it reflects, <laughs> it reflects the teaching of the, of the Bible. Right. And it, we, we grant that there are, you know, uh, the church wrestled with this, as you can see, 451 AD. And so it didn't jump on this, you know, within months of our Lord's uh, ascent. This, this took took a while. Well, it, it also takes sharpening in the face of heresies yeah, that had not yet arisen. Correct. And so correct. now that they had arisen, they were able to sharpen They're, and right. hone you, their theology. Correct. This is uh, the background to something like the Chalcedonian formula are going to be things like Nestorianism, Eutychianism, and Apollinarianism, which are three uh, Christological heresies. Uh, so you'll see that, that there, that there are, um, what sort of any qualifications that the fathers uh, make. So here we go. We then following the Holy Fathers, which presumably meant, means the, the ones that were further back than them, uh, with all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same son, our Lord Jesus, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man of a reasonable or rational soul and body, consubstantial or coessential with the father according to the godhead and consubstantial with us according to the manhood in all things like unto us without sin begotten before all ages of the father according to the godhead and in these latter days and for us and for our salvation born of the virgin mary the mother of god according to the manhood one and the same christ son lord only begotten. Now, the next few lines are the ones that we really want to pay attention to. To be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. The distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person in one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, the only begotten God, the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning him and as the Lord Jesus Christ himself has taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers is handed down to us. 
So there you have those, you have those four descriptions, right? The four uh, adverbs, is that right? The Lee ending yeah. is an uh, mm -hmm. inconfusedly, unchangeably, mm -hmm. indivisibly, inseparably. Mm -hmm. So the teaching, the, uh, what we get out of the Chalcedonian formula is the fact that the two natures are united. They are not combined or blurred, right? They're not blended. Right. Uh, I, I once heard a sermon where the preacher said that, that they were glad that, uh, that, in, that the, the son had become man and blended the, the divine and the human. Oh. And, and the skin. Yeah, I went, oh, no. <laughs> don't, don't say that. Don't That's a it. eutychianism, right? Or a form uh, of it. Could oh, be. Uh, that is bad. That's a, too much of a, mm -hmm. a one. That's an error, I guess, in one person direction uh, or that the, the, the god man is some sort of tertium quid amalgam yeah an yeah. amalgam right which means that he can't save because he's neither god nor man right he's christ <laughs> i mean there are you can you can see how this, way. the formula will will um will will be an impetus i assume for anselm's understanding of the incarnation and the atonement so athanasius mm -hmm. so you can you, there is there is a line of development that we see so after uh, discussing that for a little while then laying the foundations that are that are in the chalcedonian formula we went to the westminster confession right because nothing happened between 451 and 1643 well, quite a bit, but I only had so much, I only had one hour, believe it or not, to, to get all this uh, uh, taught. Understood. Although I'm I'm pretty sure that this uh, Dr. Tipton was would cover this in in one of his lectures, uh, and then of course we see in the Westminster Confession of Faith in the eighth chapter in particular, uh, we see these in, in uh, paragraphs two and three: the Son of God, the Second Person of the Trinity. Being very an eternal God of one substance and equal with the Father did when the fullness of time was come, take upon him man's nature with all the essential properties and common infirmities thereof, yet without sin, being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary of her substance. So that two whole, perfect and distinct natures, the Godhead and the manhood, were inseparably joined together in one person without conversion composition or confusion which person is very god and very man yet one christ the only mediator between god and man and you can see there almost the, the echoing of the chalcedonian sure. formula in, in that language of without conversion composition or confusion and remember that's so important because if christ is not god he cannot forgive sin he doesn't have the authority to do that right so that the, the critics of Jesus in his, the days of his earthly ministry were right. that if he was not God, he had no right to forgive sin in the way that he was, did. But he does. He is God. So he does have that authority. And he's also man. So therefore, he can offer himself as a sacrifice for sin be because of he's also fully man. Now, in the next the next section you see there. Uh, the Lord Jesus, in his human nature, thus united to the divine, was sanctified and anointed with the Holy Spirit above measure, having in him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, in whom it pleased the Father that all fullness should dwell, to the end that, being wholly harmless and undefiled and full of grace and truth, he might be thoroughly furnished to execute the office of a mediator and surety which office he took not unto himself, but was thereunto called by his father, who put all power and judgment into his hand and gave him commandment to execute the same. Now, I don't know about you, but there, there is a paragraph summarizing a boatload of biblical passages. You know, mm -hmm. the, the very, even the very expressions that are used in that paragraph uh, you can go back and, and find the biblical basis for, for those statements. Uh, but you see there that, that uh, uh, the divine nature upholds the human nature. And sometimes we ask, uh, we think as we're reading the uh, passion narratives, for instance, right? Uh, we think, how is it that the human nature could stand up under such terrible uh, 
persecution. But not only that, but even more so, how could the human nature of Christ stand up under the wrath of the Father, the wrath of God, right? Uh, because the wrath of God is not simply being exercised through the Roman soldiers, although that's right. true. Mm -hmm. there, there is a weightiness to the matter that's not related directly to the spikes being driven through Jesus' hands and feet or the spear being thrust into his side, although those are involved. Uh, it's the divine nature that upholds the human nature through all of this. Uh, and, of course, the presence of the Holy Spirit uh, throughout his, our Lord's ministry, that's another subject, you know, what does it mean to be given the Holy Spirit without measure? Now, the point, the, the whole point of all of this was to demonstrate that the, the hypostatic union it does, is, not a, is not a contradiction or contravention of the creator-creature distinction, that the creator-creature distinction is actually honored in the hypostatic union it is mm -hmm. not obliterated and, and that was that's the, the the point that you know that i was getting through and and we we look at several we looked at several of the larger catechism questions and then several uh related shorter catechism questions uh and then we get right to the the uh the discussion of the hypostatic union of the person of the Son of God. Again, remembering that the, the person of the Son is not a result of, a, of the, the, the combination of the two natures. It's the Son of God who is the person of the God-man. Right. And neither is the, the personality or the person of the Son a function of his human nature either. Correct. Yeah. It's uh, it's the human nature. We, if I can put it this way, is the instrument that the through which the the divine son operates. Mm. I know that, and and the in in the notes, uh, I note that the name for the two natures in one person is diophysitism, and the reason that's sig even significant is that the uh, early church dealt with s some uh, heresies that are lesser known. Uh, yeah. called monophysitism, mia, uh, mia, not mono, oh. mia physitism. Mia. So this is different, uh, a little bit different from what we think of monophysitism, which is just the one nature. Uh, the, anyway, so uh, that's the technical term for the orthodox position is diophysitism. And as you might understand, there are actually bad forms of diophysitism as well. So that's it, not the 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 sum and substance of what we say. Yeah. I usually, you know, you sometimes get visitors at your church and they want to ask you some sort of leading question because yeah. they have a they have some theological quirk and they want to find out where you stand on it before they're yeah. before they're going to. They want to. You imagine? I could just imagine somebody coming to your church and saying, "Oh yeah, Pastor, um, good to meet you. Just visiting. I was wondering, are you a, a diophysitist church or not?" <laughs> yep. Oh yeah, I'm sure that's the first the first question that dawns on anybody visiting, right? Now, well, we see all sorts have, of this rash of of things. Uh, just Easter Sunday was a few yes. days ago, and there was a rash of all these tweets of these liberals speaking on how the the resurrection is a metaphor, you know, for our rebirth and renewal, and uh, people, you know, throwing a fit that the resurrection is only metaphoric in their view. And I throw a fit too, but it's like I'm I'm well aware that liberal theology has no place for a right. bodily resurrection. So I guess it just wasn't news to me. But um right. you know, this 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 is are important things we always have to get we have to get straight oh, yeah. and, and always remind right. ourselves of orthodox teaching. Yes. Uh so you've got here uh, the divine and the human natures, those that we've already noted are, are united, but they are not combined. We don't get, as you've already noted, Camden, a tertium quid, a third thing, a mm -hmm. monster is what that would be, mm. neither, neither God nor man. Uh, and so the divine nature and uh, unites with the human nature as the uh, as the creeds and the catechism and the confession all say, very God of very God, very man of very man. Uh, God the Son possesses all divine attributes, uh, Colossians 1.19. Uh, in the uh, 
the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells in the person of Jesus Christ. So does that apply? I I agree wholeheartedly. But there could be a question. Does that how fine? I knew there was a but coming. No, there's no but. This is a clarifying question. Sure. Um, because we've already spoken on how the person of the Son relates to the essence, and how the person relates then to the to the two natures of Christ. You could say the divine essence and the divine nature are not two different things. It's the same right. thing. But we also now speak of a, a human nature. Uh, now, how then are we to understand this? That as the Son becomes incarnate and and assumes a human nature, yet retains all of his divine attributes. Right. He's still simple, immutable, uh, omniscient, omnipotent, etc. To what do we ascribe, or to what must we, or may we uh, ascribe those attributes? To, to the, the essence, to the person, no, it, to both. It would be. It would be to the person uh, with regard to the divine nature. Very good. So, Very I mean, good. the person is not a, something different from the divine nature, right? So it's precisely a, it's a unique thing about the, gaining clarity on this by recognizing that the son, the divine logos, is the person of the God-man. And so his relationship to the divine nature is different from his relationship to the human nature. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. There is we we don't speak of an 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 hypostatic divine nature. Well, you know what I mean. It's we we do speak about the human nature. Uh, it doesn't exist apart from the incarnation. Right. Now the divine nature does indeed. Right. Apart divine from the nature, human nature. You're right. Right. Mm -hmm. Apart from the human nature. Right. Another way of saying that is that the divine nature is absolute and necessary, and and the human nature is contingent. Mm hmm. Correct. Contingent upon the, the decree of God to save a people for himself and contingent upon him determining that this is the way he would do it. And then executing it in. Correct. In, in time. His, in, in, in time. Mm -hmm. So now, one, um, one phrase, the, we've got this Latin phrase that pops up sometimes when uh, we're talking. Yeah. The uh, uh, extra Calvinisticum. In, indeed. Or, what, what, really, what is that? We, which really should be called the extra Catholicum because it's in right. Athanasius, for example. In his incarnate on the incarnation. Well, we know Athanasius was a Calvinist, so I think it's. Oh, no, that's true. I mean, it's true <laughs> if we want to use a anachronistic term, but it, it's true, right? I mean, we joke about it, but there is there is continuity. Right. It's a misnomer. Earlier and later, and later theologians. Well, this uh, was a pejorative term, was it not? Yes, it was uh, labeled it, by the Lutherans. It's actually created by coined by Lutheran right. uh, scholars in the post Reformation era. And it's the idea that, that the Son of God is not constrained uh, or contained in the human nature of the God-man. In other words, the human nature does not trap the divine nature inside, right? And so the Son of God is, because the Son of God maintains or retains, or whatever language you want to use, uh, the divine attributes of simplicity, immutability, spirituality, omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence, especially omnipresence, it's, it's the case that the divine nature is, for lack of a better way of describing it, bigger than the human nature of the God-man. So the God is everywhere, or the Son is everywhere, present. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, because the divine nature is uh, uh, divine, mm -hmm. right? By definition, now, the, the, do we understand how that can work? No, we can't. We don't, right? I mean, we can affirm that it's the case, but go, we can't go much further than that. But I think this is an absolute truth, and, and it preaches. I'll tell you. Uh, I've I've uh, I've preached and I've said when when the Son of God was in the manger, he was upholding the universe. When the Son of God was tired mm -hmm. and thirsty at the site at the well at Sychar in Samaria, he was upholding the universe. When the Son of God was hanging on the cross, he was upholding the universe. And shocking of most of all is when he's dead in the tomb. Yeah, he's upholding the he's universe. He's upholding the universe. <laughs> By the word of his power. Amen. By the word of his power. Amen. Uh, and that as to his divine nature, right? Indeed. Now, having said all that, 
and that's uh, and we need to stress that, that the divine nature doesn't change that's why it's important to, to remember that we don't create an amalgam it's not a third thing it's not the divine let's put some ingredients let's put one half divine one half like salt and pepper right uh it's not doesn't work that way the two natures retain their properties that is it's truly human on the one on the one side and truly divine on the other so Christ's mm -hmm. humanity is genuine. Um, now, some people, I guess, by definition, they, they would say that this can't be the case because he's united to a divine nature. Uh, and so, so we it, get into the, the whole issue of... Well, no one said his life was normal. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, right. They're assuming that genuine means normal or typical. Typical. Uh, <laughs> In John 1, 14, of course, and 1 John 1, 1 to 3, um, uh, and among other places, uh, deals with the incarnation. So, I mean, this is, this is pretty basic uh, truth. The Son of God was incarnate in a sinful world. Okay, and that's important if we're looking at, at things like the, the uh, uh, Christ as the second Adam. Um, the, the first Adam, of course, fell in sin and was disobedient and fell in sin in a perfect world. Our Lord came to undo the damage that Adam had done uh, in a sinful world. Uh, he had a fully human nature without sinful nature and its acts. He's wholly harmless and undefiled. I don't see how you can get around that text and as some have tried to do, even in uh, evangelical circles, arguing that the, while the son did not commit sin, he did have a sinful nature. The problem with that, of course, is, is, is the assumption, that apparently, that to be human is to be sinful. Sure. Uh, I, I, I would have to go back and read some of the advocates of the view that Christ and uh the T.F. Incarnate. Torrance is one, correct? Yes, he would be an example of one. Uh, I think Bart as well, but I, I, I wouldn't want to swear by that. Mm. But certainly Torrance, who's a Bart disciple, used they used to say if, if Bart caught a cold, Torrance would sneeze. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, here's an important thing. Uh, considering everything that we said about the divine nature. Sorry, right? no. I just watched E.T. with my kids, and I'm remembering E.T. and Elliot. This is <laughs> good movie, by the e. way. E.T. gets drunk at home, and then Elliot's yes, drunk. At does, that's hilarious. <laughs> it's the um, same thing. Bouncing, if I remember, bouncing all over the walls. And, and, you, you, you get to pick which one's E.T., whether <laughs> Tor yeah. Torrance or Bart, but uh, anyway. I, I like the, Sorry. Yeah, I, it's the, the still photo, I think, where he's in the closet, surrounded by all the, oh, the stuffed, stuffed animals, animals. <laughs> and his face is right there. It's great. Yeah. I was there in the theater in 1981. That was my first movie. Yeah. Book, you know, when the movie was released, I right. do remember that. It, it was a big splash in, in the, the summer of the, right. the, the 80s. But anyways, we were saying, you know, relative then to the extra Calvinistic home and Lutheran theology, um, you know, certainly... Uh, there's variation within Lutheranism. I don't right. mean to say it's uniform, but uh, one thing that is a sticking point often arises with the doctrine of the Lord's Supper and then the differences between transubstantiation and consubstantiation. And this is this is partly the reason why there are differences. Right. This arises, the, mm -hmm. the whole idea of the extra Calvinisticum, the, the name is given to Calvinism, its view of the relationship of the divine to the human nature because of the fact that we don't we reject the the idea of the ubiquity of christ's human body right in other words everywhere where the lord's supper is celebrated christ's physical body is present that that is the lutheran the standard lutheran position yeah in with and under the the bread and right yeah we the would element. say that right. because it is a human nature and humans are not omnipresent uh, they're correct then therefore uh a union with the divine uh, in the person of the son does not therefore mean then the attributes of his human nature somehow are, are transmuted into some sort of divine human form. Right. The attributes the, retain genuine human. Uh, correct. 
qualities um, and whatnot. And so, that's why we, it's important to stress that, that as to his divine nature, he is infinite, but as to his right. human nature, he's finite. Right. Okay. Um, now, that, of course, is what gives rise to the, the debate between Lutherans and, and reform, because if Christ is, as to his human nature, is finite, that means he's delimited. That is, he's at one place at one time. And, of course, we would say that Christ physically is at the Father's right hand mm -hmm. until he comes back to claim his own uh, and to uh, judge Mm -hmm. the world in righteousness. I suppose if Christ's human nature was omnipresent, he couldn't return because he never yeah. left. Correct. I mean, and there's a sense in which that's true as to his divine nature, uh, because you, we can't divide God up. Okay. When we talk about the Trinity, it's not as though it were a pizza pie in which you slice into three pieces. Okay. Sure. So if you have the father, you have part of God. If you have the son, you have part of God. And if you have the Holy Spirit, you have part of God. We, we recognize that each person of the Godhead actually is exhaustively God. Sure. You know, it's the whole God. Now, put that is we're, is we're able to say that because of the mutual interpenetration of the three persons and what we call coherence or mm -hmm. perichoresis. Uh, and we but, can also speak of, of God being in, identified with a place as he was in the Holy of Holies or the temple, and God is still omnipresent, so there's a way that the Bible speaks of that, but we certainly would not want to say that, that the human nature of Christ is everywhere, is omnipresent. Right. It's local. Correct. That, that's the better word. Because he's a genuine humanity. Local. Correct. Right. Otherwise, it wouldn't be genuinely human. Uh what we want to say also, in addition to the two natures, is to stress that the, the Christ is one person. He's not a schizophrenic, mm -hmm. which I suppose I, you know, would might arise if, if a person isn't careful. We say that he's not two persons, but one. And I think it's Nestorianism that is the, uh, the guilty of the turning the Son of God into, or the Christ into two persons. Right, right. Um, the Son of God as we've already said, is the person who is united to a reasonable soul and a true body. Uh, we don't have two persons. We don't have a divine and a human person. It's persons, plural. We have one person who is the divine son of God, the Logos. The human nature of Jesus Christ did not exist before or apart from the incarnation. Um, and that's why we can say the human nature of, of the Lord Jesus Christ is instrumental. Uh, and this is where, the, you, if you've done any technical reading in this field, you've run across the expression and hypostasis and en hypostasis. Uh, that, just, that just means, uh, I guess you would say, a non-incarnated, that's not the right way, non-inhabited, non-united. Sure. You, well, what that protects against is any idea that it protects against any form of adoptionism for one, correct. that, that right. there is a human person existing. Uh, and then God says, I'll take that one. And then correct. he merges, he unites it to, uh, correct. the person of the son or, you know, that, that there's some existence or point in time in which that human nature is not united, even if it correct. was created Correct. for that purpose originally, that it was not united always with the person of the Son. Right. I mean, Again, it's, these it's, are problems would... that don't come up until uh, necessarily somebody goes that route with a, right. with a heresy. They're not necessarily things you're always going to foresee, which is why they don't often arise until centuries later when somebody presents a view that's contrary exactly. to Scripture in this way. It shows that it shows that Christianity is not just a historical faith with regard to the giving of revelation and scripture and the canonization, but it's it's also historical in how it's worked out, the application of redemption, right? And and the church has to just as we as individuals uh, need to be progressively sanctified, uh, so the church itself goes through a similar kind of process uh, in in its maturity. Now, the Son of God, related to what we've just said, the Son of God existed in a pre-incarnate state. In other words, the Son of God is sent by the Father, uh, and the Son of God 
voluntarily agrees to take to himself a true body and a reasonable soul. Presumably, when Paul says that that the son did not consider uh, the divine nature uh, something to hold on to, there's a son who is not considering the divine nature something to be held on to prior to the mm -hmm. incarnation. Right. That, that means that there was a son of God before the incarnation. Mm -hmm. And this is often referred to as the logos a sarcos or the with that unfleshed logos. Yeah, one with consciousness and one who right. thinks and acts. He did not consider it. Correct. Consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but that made himself nothing. Right. right. That, and I see definitely, you know, a warrant for the pactum salutis there, but also yeah. warrant for distinction of persons. Right. And, uh, in, in, you know, in a sense, uh, a way in which the son knows he's the son and not the father. Correct. Uh, while that blows our mind, and it, it ought to, <laughs> right? If it doesn't, then there's something wrong with you. <laughs> so the, pre the, the Son of God existed in a pre-incarnate state. That's a debate in, in biblical scholarship and theology, of course. Uh, if you don't take the Bible as the Word of God, or, or consistently do that, you can fall into some of these errors. So the Son of God exists in a pre-incarnate state, and then at one at a particular point in time in history, the Son of God takes to himself a true body and a reasonable soul, and that is sometimes referred to as logos en sarcos. That means the enfleshed or embodied logos. Sometimes there's a, other language used that's getting at other aspects of the of the date the relationship of the son of god to the god man jesus christ we've noted that he existed existed in a pre-incarnate state as the second person of the triune godhead immutable dynamic in a perichoretic relation with the father and the spirit the logos existed in the divine mind if we can put it that way as the logos and diathetos that means the, the, the logos as thought, but not yet spoken. And then the logos prophorikos as the spoken word. Sure. Um, if you read any Greek Orthodox theology or mm -hmm. Thomas Torrance, uh, you'll run I across I see those it. in Rahner sometimes too, but he's uh, definitely influenced by the East on those things. So you see that. And, and that's, a, that's a legitimate distinction. Uh, the, that the sun again exists before going forth. Uh, the word, the word of God exists apart from its being uttered. It's another way of putting it. So the hypostatic union is a manifestation, as I've already said, of the creator-creature distinction in personal form, or better, in a person. Right? The Son of God, the the, the divine and human natures don't contradict the uh, the creator creature distinction, which is basically God is God and we are not. Uh, so sometimes the, the question arises: uh, How did the God Man display suprahuman knowledge and power? In other words, the miracles that we often see that we see in the scriptures that the Lord performs. Uh, how is it that you have that on the one hand where the, the Christ knows what's in the heart of certain men and the texts of the gospel specifically say he does, right? Yes. And on the other hand, there are things he doesn't know. Mm -hmm. How do we bring those together? Well, it is related to the divine and human nature, of course. But of course, how is it that something that's divine, whether it be knowledge or power, how is that conveyed to the Son? Uh, one possible suggestion, if I may call it a communication between the divine and human natures with regard to knowledge, was suggested by the Puritan theologian John Owen, who said that the Holy Spirit, as the bond of union between the divine and human natures, shares from the divine nature with the human nature. That's one possibility. Makes sense whether that's actually how things work. Um, we may never know. You know, the Lord isn't obligated to tell us, even in heaven, he's <laughs> right. not obligated to tell us, right? Right. Uh, and we've already mentioned this, but the divine and human natures are predicated of the one person of the Son of God, but these do not cross-pollinate or cross-fertilize. 
Uh, for instance, as we've already noted in the, uh, the dispute between the Reformed and the Lutheran in the, about the Lord's Supper, the Reformed argue against the ubiquity of Christ's body. That is that Christ's body is everywhere present where the Lord's Supper is celebrated. And the Lutherans accuse us of, of uh, extra Calvinisticum. Uh, the difference between the, the communicatio idiomatum, the sharing of the attributes, the, in the Reformed understanding, the two natures share, are the attributes are shared with the one person. In Lutheranism, the human nature can, is shared with the divine nature. I believe it's not the other way around. So it's not, it's not equal. It's not the divine characteristics of the divine nature are attributed to the human. Uh, well, they are in the instance of ubiquity, right? So the omnipresence becomes a, a, a factor of the human nature. It's not the other way around, if I remember correctly. I was corrected on that one time uh, by a Lutheran. Mm. So, okay, all right. So, uh, so in Scripture, things are said of one of the attributes and applied to the other. For instance, in, in Acts 20, 28, when Paul is speaking to the elders in Ephesus, he talks about how God having purchased the church with his blood. Okay, well, you know, God can't, doesn't have blood. Well, the Son of God has blood mm -hmm. because he has a divine nature united to a human nature. Right. Uh, and, of course, that's putting in long form what Paul said mm -hmm. in short form. Uh, things are said of Jesus Christ properly as to his divine nature and improperly of his, his human nature as regards his divine person. It's just, just Again, remember, this was a class delivered in the seminary, so it's... He, assumes a little bit of familiarity with that way of talking. Uh, the Son of God came down from heaven for us and for our salvation. And so I would argue that we have not exercised vain speculation with this topic. The church has wrestled with scripture in both its express statements and by good and necessary consequence to understand the nature of the real man who was nevertheless God and to be worshiped. If Jesus Christ isn't who we have seen here in our conversation this afternoon, then really we are guilty of idolatry. If we worship Jesus and all he was, was either a mere man or an amalgam, uh, then mm -hmm. he's a third thing, which means he's neither God nor man. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so that's, that's uh, and then I wrapped it up with what I had already said earlier about the, the son of God upholding the whole universe right. when he, you know, in the, in the manger and, and uh, tired and thirsty at the well. No, uh, I know. It's like our. Now, these issues are always, they're perennial because yes. they're always being challenged and presented on the edges. Um, you know, I, I've, I've said it many times on our program, but, <clears throat> you know, Carl Rahner presents a, a, the need for what he calls a, a new Christology for an evolutionary view of the world. So in his mind, you will look at Chalcedon and say this was good and it was beneficial for the church. It was even, in his Catholic worldview, he could even say this is infallible teaching that the church has expressed. Uh, nevertheless, we need a new Christology for an evolutionary view of the world. We need God to speak a new word uh, and reformulate Christology for our new contemporary context. Right. And so for him, he he could say that God could perhaps speak something different that is nonetheless still infallible for our context. Uh, you know, but we don't find that extreme necessarily within the reform community. Nevertheless, we do still find often challenges that arise yeah. because they start with either an unfamiliarity with Orthodox Christology or perhaps with a slight deviation in truth and when you amplify that, it's very much like, you know, sighting in a, a scope on a rifle. You might be just a tick or two off. Uh, when you're shooting at 10 yards, it's not, you're not going to notice. When you stretch that out at 400 yards, you might be feet, right. feet off the mark. And so when you have an error in your doctrine of God or Christology in this regard, or even just kind of like a, a little bit of a deviation, it's not fully tightened down. When you start to build other doctrines and theologies upon that, you often can 
uh, how should we say, compound or amplify yes. Yes. the problems. And of course, that that is the when we talk about systematic theology, that's what the systematic means, right? The mm. the it's like a uh, you know if I you could say it's like a, a jigsaw puzzle or a Jenga puzzle. Um, you pull out one part, and all these other yeah. parts are affected by by that 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 change. And that's how, and that can be thought of both in a positive, and we've kind of said it in the negative way. But positively, that means um, the beauty of God, who He is, and also the beauty and symmetry of the Scriptures, the interrelatedness. So, so those are a way of the, looking yes. at the same dynamic from a positive angle mm -hmm. all of this is as you say perennial issues that that uh, have a tendency to come up again oh you know if not in each generation you know maybe in each century uh, there seems to be a need for i think so church. and it's it's helpful for thinking. us all and we should always be um studying these things and reviewing um i have young children so i seek to catechize my kids and raise them up and the nurture and admonition of the Lord, but even for our own hearts and minds, we even, you know, who often like to spend time on, quote, more advanced things, uh, unquote, right. never graduate from orthodox no. theology. Right. Uh, and we should never presume that we are beyond uh, the study of, of God's word or beyond, you know, some of these basic categories, but always should relish them and really enjoy um, meditating upon these wonderful truths um, on who our Savior is and what He has done for us. You know, all all of this is tied to our redemption. Mm -hmm. It's not like these men, these bishops, were sitting around with nothing to do and <laughs> and decided to uh, you know they weren't in a Parisian coffee right. a cafe <laughs> sidewalk cafe talking about these things. These were mm -hmm. men who often it's often been said they came with missing eyes and missing limbs mm. with scars from having lived through uh being per the persecutions of various kinds over the years yeah. uh, and and so they were concerned to guard the doctrine essential for the salvation of god's people mm -hmm. uh, and as they wrestled with these things they, they debated these things and those of us who are presbyterian we have some idea of what that might have been like mm -hmm. Because we have sessions, we have presbyteries, and we have general assemblies. And so we have some idea of what a group debate looks like. And it's hard work, <laughs> right? It, to produce that kind of right. these kinds of documents like the Westminster Confession. Oh, yeah. Look at the minutes, you know, all the, uh, uh, the exactly. enormous work that, that uh, Dr. Right. Van Dixhorn has done to, to compile those and study those. Oh. It's just almost inconceivable the amount of effort to go in there. We we try trying to write some you know like a response to a protest at Presbytery. Good night. <laughs> you, uh, just to even handle that sort of thing, you have to send two or three guys off as a committee to come back right. with a recommendation. So, but can yeah. you imagine just doing something of the magnitude of a confessional ecumenical statement? It's it's almost an inconceivable. Yes, and, and and maybe only because we are not in the habit of doing that sure. as frequently as the, the church in the Middle Ages and the Reformation and early mm. church were in the habit of doing these things. Uh, John Frame has said that, you know, that this is, he doesn't think we live in a confessional age in that regard. Mm. And of course, Scott Clark has said we ought to, right? One of the things that, that Dr. Clark has said is that we ought to be in the habit uh, of of producing creeds and confessions that that are scriptural and orthodox, faithful to what has gone before. Oh yeah, uh, we ought to be able to do that. It mm -hmm. ought to be the thing that we do that arises from our worship and mm -hmm. our study. Mm -hmm. I think so. Without neglecting what we have received, right? Yeah, you know, right. Absolutely. Well, Jeff, thanks so much for taking the time to walk us through this lecture and this important subject matter. And uh, we do look forward to talking to you more. We hope to have you on some more episodes coming up. We've got a lot of opportunity arising. It's going to be a very, very busy month uh, for many of us here at Reform Forum in May. I've got a lot of travel coming up and things with church. And I'm going to be in Philadelphia for the Ministerial Training Institute of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, taking that uh, class uh, by uh, taught by... Dr. Chad Van Dixhorn on the Westminster Standards 
the Westminster Assembly. Should be a good, uh, wonderful class. I've been wanting to take oh. it for many, many years. So finally, I'm, at, I'm able to take it. And then some other trips. So I know you've got uh, other stuff lined up too, Jeff. But yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> a lot I'm of things going on. Far, far flung places from here, I should say. <laughs> yes. Texas yeah. and Tennessee. Oh, my goodness. Well, you shall enjoy your time there. But I do want to thank uh, you and I want to thank all the listeners and hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.